the Holy Spirit leads, every meeting is going to be different because that's what the Holy Spirit wants. I was reminded of some years back, Bob Mumford, I don't know if you ever heard of him. He was uh, part of my, my teaching, helped me, mentored me in certain areas. <clears throat> Anyhow, he was invited to come to a church and he asked the Lord, Lord, what do you want me to talk about? No answer. He got to the church. Lord, what do you want me to talk about? No answer. Okay, okay, Lord, whatever you have in mind. He goes up by the podium. Lord, what do you want me to talk about? Anything? And he says, you see that lady in the back seat there? She has this big summer hat on. Call her to the front and let her play the piano. So he did. Woman got up, went to the front. She started playing the piano, and the audience was in tears. They were crying out to God. The Holy Spirit ministered to them through the song. Isn't that something? Here, the man, you know, this famous in his days, is ready to preach the word, and the Lord says, No. I want this woman to come to the front and play the piano. Wow. That's what I say, you know, every meeting is going to be different. And that's good because we want the Holy Spirit to work. We don't want to do our own thing. So today I'm going to call somebody to the front. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> Hallelujah. Well, we all know it's Palm Sunday. And... Uh, it's something that the Lord put on my heart to talk a little bit about it and get into something that we all need to know and we all need to learn. We all need to be in tune with the Lord. So, Lord, I just open up the service for you again, Lord. We know that you're here by your Spirit. We thank you, Holy Spirit, being in us, working in us, and working through us. Thank you for your willingness. You come into our lives. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for sending him down here to be our teacher, to be our guide, to be our encourager, to lift us up, to draw us closer to you, Lord. So I thank you for that. And as we look into your word, I ask that we receive it that's coming from you, and we act on that the way you want us to act, to be that what you want us to be. In Jesus' name, amen. So let's start out reading a long passage there, but it's important to read that whole passage in John 12, verses 9 through 19. Meanwhile, a large crowd of Jews found out that Jesus was there and came, not only because of him, but also to see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. So the chief priests made plans to kill Lazarus as well. For an account of him, many of the Jews were going over to Jesus and believing in him. And the next day, the great crowd that had come for the festival heard that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. And they took palm branches and went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the King of Israel. And Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it, and as it is written, Do not be afraid, daughter Zion. See, your king is coming, seated on a donkey's colt. At first, his disciples did not understand all this. Only after Jesus was glorified did they realize that these things had been written about him and that these things had been done to him. Now the crowd that was with him when he called Lazarus from the tomb and raised him from the dead, continued to spread the word. Many people, because they had heard that he had performed this sign, went out to meet him. And so the Pharisees said to one another, See, this is getting us nowhere. Look at, look at how the whole world has gone after him. Hallelujah. <laughs> What I want to point out here in this particular passage is, is some groups of people, 
that came together. And there are like, let's see how many did I have here, about four of them roughly. First of all, I want to point out the disciples that were there. Now, they didn't understand everything what was going on, but yet the disciple is, as we were taught before in our Bible study, a disciple is a learner, first of all. And these disciples, they were learning about Jesus. And there's some, they didn't understand some things that he said and something that he was doing. They didn't understand, of course. But they followed him. So they were, they were a learner. They were a follower. And then what did they do later on? As they got baptized in the Holy Spirit, they were transmitters. They passed it on to others. And God honored that and glorified them. So that was the, the one crowd. And then there was those who withdrew from the legalistic religious church because they were talking about they want to kill Lazarus also. And as we know, the, the Jewish uh, at that time, they believed in, the, in, the, in keeping the laws, let's put it that way. They didn't have the grace of God. They didn't understand Jesus. They just wanted to kill him because he threatened, he threatened their church, people leaving their church to come to him. And we hear that every once in a while nowadays. You know, people leave the church because they didn't get fed or whatever reason they have to leave someplace. But the point is that, uh, yeah, these, these people, they, they just left that church. That, that was the second group. And then, of course, there were those who were interested to see miracles happen or the one that performed miracles. Now, when the charismatic movement started in the, by us in our area, at least in the 60s, and I was part of that. And my wife and I, at that time, we, we ran from one church to another where we heard something was going on over there. You know, people were slain in the spirit, slain in the spirit. What's that? People were healed. Wow, what's going on? Let's go see. And so we ran from one church to another church. So it was not uncommon. And so these people here, they wanted to see Jesus, they heard that he raised up Lazarus, and so they wanted to see what that man looked like, okay? Now, the, the whole point of this is that, so as, as we did in the past, ran from one church to another, you never learn anything. You learn, maybe, well, I shouldn't say learn anything. You may, you may be growing in faith because you see that God is real and he's working, you know, and he manifested himself in different areas. But there was never any true growth coming forth because you're running around from one place to another. I mean, just like these people here, they came just to see what that man looked like. And then, of course, there were these religious leaders who were jealous and fearful of Jesus, and they, they planned on killing him. Now, the, the, in, the other interesting part is the, the crowd here were praising the Lord. Hallelujah. They were shouting and waving palms and all kinds of things. And, and, uh, but the sad part is, not even a week later, what did they do instead of praising the Lord and saying, Hallelujah, crucify him, crucify him, crucify him. How quickly people change, don't we? That included us. And we, we know that the Lord willingly laid down his life for you and for me. To he let himself be crucified. Now, if you read a story about the crucifixion, like about uh, uh, a medical <clears throat> profession, the way they explain it, it had to be a very, 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 very painful situation, you know? You figure, and he was beaten. His back was all open up from the beating, then he was bleeding and all, and then they hang him on, on, a, on a rough wood. I mean, it's not like the crosses that we see nowadays with jewels and all kinds of stuff. No, that cross was, was rough wood, just horn, you know, just chopped apart and, and splinters and all kinds of things can happen to you. And so you're, you're leaning against that cross like that with your wounds, and you had to move because you wanted to breathe. And that's the other part, you hang, your hands hanging up there, and, and you can't hardly breathe anymore. And everything just pulls out there, and the back hurts. And, and then, of course, he had the crown of thorns on him that was bleeding also, because there were those long thorns that they just pounded on his head. Now, what I'm trying to say is, the Lord wants us 
to be like him. Does that mean hanging on the cross? No, not hanging on the cross, but dying to self, crucifying our old self. Okay? Excuse me. So, since he lives in us, the Holy Spirit, he wants to help you and me to become more and more like Jesus. And I think that's, that's what the Lord wanted me to learn, to become more and more like Jesus, to prepare the way for us like the people did with the pounds for Jesus. And so the Holy Spirit is trying to help us and wants to help us to become more and more like Jesus. And he's preparing the way for us through his word. And so we see to become transformed through his word is very important for us to realize, first of all, to, come, to become transformed through God's word. And what does it say there? Let's take a look in, in Acts chapter 20, verse 25 to 32, I think I got down there. Okay. Now, this is, let me just start this here. This is a, a short input from Paul going to Ephesus. And this was his last visit to the church of Ephesus. And he told him, though, but the Lord and the Holy Spirit had put something on Paul to let these people know there are going to be wolves amongst you, tearing your congregation apart. And I want you to know about that. And I want you to warn about that. But then he goes on as we read this passage here in Acts 20. He says, no, now I know that none of you among whom I have gone about preaching the kingdom will ever see me again. Therefore, I declare to you today that I am innocent of the blood of any of you. For I have not hesitated to proclaim to you the whole will of God. So keep watch over yourselves and all the flock of which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. Be shepherds of the church of God, which he bought with his own blood. Now I know that after I leave, savage wolves will come in among you and will not spare the flock. Even from your own number, men will arise and distort the truth in order to draw away disciples after them. So be on your guard. Remember that for three years, I never stopped warning each of you night and day with tears. And now I commit you to God and to the word of his grace, which can build you up and give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. He's telling them, the word of God will build you up. That's why it's important for us to read the Bible, to study the Bible, because that will help you with the guidance of the Holy Spirit, of course, to be built up. And that's so important for us to realize that. You see, God's word will build you up into what God wants you to be, and will provide whatever you need to do it and how to do it by the Holy Spirit. So let's take a look at Romans 8, verse 28 and 29. And it says there, And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his Son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. Look at that again. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to what? To the image of his Son. In other words, the Lord wants us to become more and more like the Lord Jesus Christ. Do you realize then that God loves you so much that he wants you to take on the example of the Lord Jesus Christ, that he 
wants you to become more and more like the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why I said, like he has been crucified, so we should be crucified ourselves, laying down our, our lives for the Lord. You see, Jesus did not die on the cross just so we could live comfortable lives. No, he wants to make us like himself. This is our greatest privilege. Just think about that. He wants us to be like himself. That's a, such a great privilege. That's such a, uh, you might even say, an honor. You know, that the Lord wants us, every one of us, to become more and more like Jesus. And we must not, we must not give up on that. We must work towards it with the help of the Holy Spirit, of course. Now, we must understand and not forget that we were made by God and for God. You were created by God way, way back. It had nothing to do with it. You can create yourself. You came into this world, yes, you used your parents, of course, and their parents and their parents and their parents and so on down the line. But God is the one that gives life. God is the one that created you at this time to be here, at this time for his purpose not for your own purpose. That's something we have to understand. We have to really take it in because our flesh always wants to rise up and do its own thing. And God wants us to become more and more like Jesus. So as we go on here, <laughs> the desire to be a God of course, no, let's, no, I'm sorry. I, I got to look at my note here. Okay, we must not forget that we were made by God and for God, and we will never become God or even a God. That's not the purpose of it. Now, at the beginning, Adam and Eve, Satan persuaded them to follow him, and to follow his advice, and they disobeyed God. Why? Because he told them that, you know, you shall be as gods. And they shall be able to know like what God knows and all these kind of things. In other words, you're going to be just like, like God himself. And of course, the enemy took that and uh, put uh, pride into their life because Satan himself is the prideest person or the prideest being that ever existed in heaven. And that's why he got kicked out of heaven, because he thought he could be more like God, or even better than God. And so when he persuaded Adam and Eve to do that, okay, they fell for it. The lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, the pride of life, these three main things that came into, into the uh, situation that the enemy still uses today. He tries to persuade people, to look, look at what, what you're doing. Look at, man, you accomplished so much, you know, and when you're going to retire, oh, may, maybe you'll be a millionaire, you know, and stuff like that, and on and on, going on with the pride of life, and just looking at yourself, forgetting that you were made by God and for God. And that's so important for us to, to realize, to understand that. You see, but the desire to be a God still shows up amongst us. Why? When our flesh reacts. When our flesh reacts, when we want to control our circumstances, for instance, when we want to control people. You see, that's all part of the enemy. That flesh wants to rise up every once in a while when we want to be in charge of things. And that's not what the Lord had in mind. The Lord wants us to be transformed. He wants to transform our character. And part of that transformation, as we read in the Bible, is uh, we find that, in, uh, for instance, in Matthew chapter 5 through 7, talks about the Beatitudes there. Now, the Beatitudes we can use and say, be in this attitude. You see, that's, that's what the Lord wants us to be like, what we read in there. And, and part of that teaching that, that we went through, especially to chapter 5, 
we see that, that the Lord wants us to develop our character. Okay? Why? So that we can be more and more like God. So that we can have a godly conduct. The character and the conduct. And then when we act properly in the godly conduct, conduct I should say, we have godly influence in this world. That's the development of the character that the, that the Lord wants us to have. Then, of course, we have the, in Galatians 5, the fruit of the Spirit. We see in there that it starts out with love. The first word of that fruit is love. And if we love, then the rest of that fruit will follow in the same order. We love the Lord, and we have peace with the Lord. We enjoy the Lord because we love the Lord. And all the fruit that we see in there, and even our, our, our um, uh, what would you call it? Well, our faithfulness, of course. We are faithful to the Lord because of the love that shows right at the beginning. The Lord starts with love. And love is better explained in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. So if you want to read about the true agape love, which is God kind of love, you'll be surprised in how many things we fail in that. But that's the way we must be. That's the way we should act. And there's, there's one thing that I want to see, uh, I want you to see in Second Peter chapter 1, verses 5 through 11. And Peter here puts these things up for us. For this very reason, make every effort. Now, we should make an effort to grow and to become more and more like Jesus. For this re very reason, make every effort to add to your faith goodness, to goodness knowledge, and to knowledge self-control, and to self-control perseverance, and to perseverance godliness, and to godliness mutual affection, and to mutual affection love. For if you possess these qualities in increasing measure, they will keep you from being ineffective and unproductive in your knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. But whoever does not have them is nearsighted and blind, forgetting that they have been cleansed from their past sins. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, make every effort <clears throat> to confirm your calling and election. For if you do these things, you will never stumble, and you will receive a rich welcome into the eternal kingdom of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It's an interesting study, that particular section. And it's wonderful to know that if we want to be successful, we have to do what God's Word teaches us what the Holy Spirit wants to do in us and through us. And that's why I would like for you to take a look in Philippians chapter 2, verse 12 and 13. Therefore, my dear friends, as you have always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, this is Paul speaking, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. For it is God who works in you, to will and to act in order to fulfill his good purpose. You see, this is something that uh, people misunderstand. Because they, they, we, we see in this particular section two parts of spiritual growth. The first part is to work out your salvation, which is our responsibility. To work out your, in other words, you have been saved, you have received the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior and the Holy Spirit comes into you, and so now work out of what you learn from the Word, what the Holy Spirit tells you to do, and act on that. And the second part, of course, is to work in us, which, of course, is God's role. So you never can do it by yourself. You have to release your flesh. You have to die, you have to, die to your flesh, and you have to be open to what the Lord wants you to do. We have to be acting on that. But as some people misunderstand this thing about the salvation part, this is not about how to be saved, but how to grow. Because it tells us there 
It does not say work for your salvation, work out your salvation. You already have salvation. Now you work it out. You let the Lord work it out in you because he is in you to help you to do the things that the Lord wants you to do. Hallelujah. You see, the Holy Spirit will lead us to the cross. Holy Spirit will lead you to the cross. Why? To die to certain things that he exposes inside of you. Just put it on the cross. You know, when we have water baptism, it's a picture of dying to self and resurrection. Because when you go into the water, you don't just get sprinkled. You actually put your whole body in the water. It's like you're being put in a grave. Okay? That's a sign that you leave all your old nature, your old flesh, your own ideas in that grave. And then when you come up, you're resurrected into the new life that God has given you. And that's what it's all about. That's what wa true water baptism is all about. And you realize that when you've been baptized in water, that's what the Lord wants you to do, to live in a new life. Leave that old junk in the grave. Don't dig it up again. Just act the way the Lord wants you to act if you want to become more and more like Jesus. And I'm sure, I'm sure we all would like that, don't we? You see, that there's this thing also, like I talked last time about that, that grain of wheat. Now, that grain of wheat has to be put into the ground. It has to die into the ground in order for that hard shell to open up so that the life can come through and bear fruit. And that's the same with us. We have sometimes such hardness in us, and the Lord says, no. Break that. Break that. Get rid of that hardness. Break it open. Let my spirit come through. Because sometimes we hold, we hold the spirit back, the Holy Spirit back, because of our own ideas of what we want to do. And we think we know better than God. And <laughs> it doesn't work that way. You have to let the Holy Spirit work in you and through you. You see, for, for God to live out his life in us, and we do not give him our lives in which he can live. That's not true salvation. If you're truly born again, you realize God living in us, in you. Okay? And you want to give all that the Lord wants from you. Because he died for you. Will you die for him? Will you be there for him? Will you want to be becoming more and more like Jesus, or do you want to you want to stay as, as a child, as a little baby? You know, we were not created to remain as children. Yes, we are born, and we may be a year old or two year old in the Lord, and all these things, just like in the natural, you grow, and you grow, and you come to the point where you are so, uh, well, mature, let's put it that way, you're so mature, that you are able to produce children. In other words, you are able to witness to others and to bring children into God's kingdom. Because that's why the Lord wants us to keep on growing. You might be growing older, but never grow up. How about that? I've known of people who've been Christians, so-called Christians, for 50 years. And they're still acting like babies. They still need to be fed with the milk, the bottle into their mouth, you know, wheel them around in a baby cart, putting diapers on them, little booties and all these kind of things. That's kind of silly, isn't it? But that's sad to say, some of so-called Christians, not saying that they have not received the Lord Jesus, but they have not matured. They want to be fed all the time. You know, that's why we have Bible studies here on Wednesdays to help you to grow also. But the most important part is what do you do at home when you're not at church? Do you ever read the Bible? 
it's like like this pastor came came to this family and and uh, the mother said to, to her daughter, "Honey, you go 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 get go get what the, the what we reading did. Go get that Bible over there. Whatever whatever we reading." And so what she do? She comes back with a Sears catalog. <laughs> That's what they've been reading. <laughs> This is from, from way back, of course, Sears catalog. We don't have it anymore, but in those days, you know what I mean. Okay. So God gave us a new life, and we are responsible to develop it with the help, of course, of the Holy Spirit. And Paul, Paul tells us in, uh, well, let's, let's go up here first. In Hebrews chapter 5, verse 12 through 14. Now, we're not sure whether Paul wrote Hebrews or not. Uh, people have questions about that. But let's just say it was, it was a, uh, a follower of the Lord who wrote the book of Hebrews. And well, actually, the Holy Spirit did that, but he used somebody. Anyhow, so in fact, though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you the elementary truth of God's word all over again. You need milk, not solid food. Anyone who lives on milk being still an infant is not acquainted with the teaching about righteousness. But solid food is for the mature, who by constant use have trained themselves to distinguish good from evil, to distinguish what the Lord wants you to do, to recognize the importance of eating yourself, feeding yourself, I mean not just sucking on somebody's milk bottle that passed on to you, but to become strong in the Lord, to mature in the Lord. And then Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 14, verse 20, Brothers and sisters, stop thinking like children. In regard to evil, be infants, but in your thinking, be adults. There you go. Be innocent. In the evil part, like an infant, they don't think about the evilness in this world. They don't even know anything about the evil in this world. And that's in a way we, we can't help but see it. It's all around us, you know. But the point is not to focus on that, but to focus on what the Lord wants you to be. So grow up, be mature, and take your spiritual growth th seriously. This is very important that you grow in the Lord. If you want to be successful as a Christian, if you want to lead somebody to the Lord, being successful in that. If you want the Lord to bless you, this is so important for us to, to realize the, the seriousness of growing up. You see, obedience to God can bring supernatural victories. As we obey God, God recognizes that, and we will be more victorious than we ever were before. Because God sees you seriously. He sees that you want to grow. And that's, that's so much that the Lord desires from us to become more and more like him. Now, of course, it, it takes a commitment. It takes a commitment. You must want to grow. You must decide to grow. You must make an effort to grow. You must be persistent and grow. You see, <laughs> we become whatever we are committed to. Are you committed to the Lord? Are you committed to his word? You become whatever you committed to. That's why the Lord brought this on my, on my heart, that we all need to, to grow, to become more of an example to the world. See, every choice has eternal consequences. So choose wisely. Choose wisely. Oh, hallelujah. Start thinking and acting God's ways and your ways, and, and, and not your ways, and you will experience God in your life. How many amongst us here have ever experienced God in their life? Okay, your hands go up. Hallelujah. You know, there's, there's uh, something 
when some some years back when I was in a uh, Plymouth Brethren Church, and they had a Vana group going on there, and so, so they asked if I wouldn't be part of it as a as a leader with the with the kids at what age? And I said yeah, anywhere from nine to twelve, somewhere in that area. I said okay, I give it a shot. And so one one day, at home, my dryer didn't work. And so I looked at it, and being a, being a you know, wise guy and you know, knowing everything about dryers, you know, and washers and all that stuff, yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I opened it up and looked at see if there was a wire loose or whatever, and there was dust in there, of course, so I cleaned all that up and, and then went back and didn't work. I said, Lord, I don't know what to do about this, but you do. What is the problem, Lord? Give me some, some hint. And so he says, open the door. I opened that door. He said, now close it. I closed the door and that thing went on. <laughs> and it had been running ever since. <laughs> so I used, I used that, talking about the kids in Havana. I used that for an example. I told the, kids, the children there that, uh, you know, the Lord is, is so good. He loves you so much. He's even involved in little things. So I, I, gave him, I gave him that story about that dryer, you know. And they were like that. I says, now, anybody here who would like to have that Lord in their own life, how about it? Well, three guys, three young boys accepted the Lord that day. That was one of my experiences with God. You know, God works in different ways. There was one more time that, uh, well, I had other ones, but this one really sticks out to me. I was studying for, to bring a sermon to the church, and I was studying for it, and, and I know I, I had a book that had given me some, some insight in that, so I, I said, I got to find that book. So I got about you know, 500 books or something like that. <laughs> Anyhow, so I got them all on the shelf, so I go. I couldn't find it. I couldn't find the book. I knew I had it. I knew I didn't give it away. So I, I, again, I sat down, Lord, you want me to talk about this? I need something about that this particular pastor wrote and that spoke to me. I know it was you that did it. Help me to find that book. And as I was sitting there and praying like that, I heard a noise. You know what happened? The books are like this. One of the books came out like that. Just tipped out. It didn't come fly, flying out. It just tipped over. And I went over and looked at it. That was the book I was looking for. Is that God or isn't it God? <laughs> oh, hallelujah. So we can have experiences like that, you know, as we trust our Lord. If we give ourselves wholeheartedly to the Lord, the Lord is there for you. And he's there even if you don't obey him. He still loves you. But he is going to push and push and push and take you to the cross to die do those things, to give up those things, so that the Holy Spirit is able to, to help us. Then he takes us back to himself, the Holy Spirit, and keeps ministering to us. And there might be some more ways to the cross that you have to go to lay down your life. But that's what it's all about. That's what we're here for. We're here not for ourselves. We're here for the Lord. If you truly are committed to him, if you truly recognize how much he loves you, I mean, how much more can he do and give his life for you so that you can have his life? I mean, that's, that's a big thing. That's a very big thing. Taking all our sins and sickness and diseases and sorrows on the cross. You know how he could do that? Well, of course, he was God, man. And so... When we, when we recognize what God is doing for each one of us, he, oh boy, he not only trans transforms us by reading the word of God, but you know something else? He transforms us through trouble. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah, Let's see what, what, the, what uh, the Lord says in John 16, verse 33. I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world, you will have trouble. 
but take heart, I have overcome the world. We can overcome the world, even in our difficult times and troubles that, that we're going through, you know? <laughs> God has a purpose behind every problem, every circumstance to develop us, to become more and more like Christ. <clears throat> Everything that happens to you and me, the child of God, there is a Father who filters everything. Our Heavenly Father knows exactly what you're going through. And he checks it out, he filters it, and he says, I can use that to help my child grow. Wow. I have to go through trouble. I have to go through pain, I have to go through sickness, so that you can bless me more. Yeah, that's what it seems like. He wants us to be developed more and more like the Lord. Hallelujah. So he tends to use it for good, the bad things. Even when Satan and others mean it for bad, God takes that, turns it around to those who love God and makes something good out of that. Now, remember that. It says yeah, at the beginning, those who love God. Take a look again in, in Romans 8, 28 through 29. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. For those God foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brothers and sisters. Talking about, of course, the Lord Jesus being the first one. So you see, God takes bad things, turns them around, makes something good out of that. I mean, you know, you, you, you look back in the Old Testament. God could have kept Joseph out of jail. Could have kept Joseph out of the troubles that he went through. He could have. How about Daniel? He could have stopped him from being thrown into the, the lions then. He could have stopped that. How about those, those three men that were thrown into the fiery furnace? God could have stopped that, but he didn't. He didn't. Why? Why did they have to go through all that? And talk about the Job. The difficulty that he went through. Why? Well, God had a point in that. God had, God had a plan in that. And they were drawn closer to the Lord because of the difficult things that they went through. Not only that, they bore fruit for the Lord. I mean, they take, take like Job, we talked about that on Wednesday a little bit, but take Job, the things that he went through, yes, God loved him. He was a friend of God. It tells you right at the beginning. But if you go and read that, that whole story there, the book of Job, you come towards the end. And God has to ask him some question. Now, why did he ask those questions? He says, Job, were you there when I created this? Job, were you there when I did this and when I did that? And all these different things the Lord pointed out to him. And Job had to look at himself. No. And you know what, what happened? It dawned on him that he was, in a way, self-righteous. He thought he knew all about God. You know, and God had to point that out to him. That's why he had to go through that. For him to recognize that he wasn't the way the Lord wanted him to be. And so when, when Job recognized that and asked for forgiveness about that, and the Lord forgave him, of course, and then he told him to pray for those three comforters, <laughs> those three men who had all kinds of excuses. Well, this happened to you because you sinned, and on down the line they'd thrown these things at him. And then Job prayed for them, and they were released, they were, they were blessed. But the outcome of all of that, even though Job had to go through the suffering, the Lord told the devil not to take his life. 
because he knew that Joe belonged to him, you know, of course. But he had to make this tour, had to allow Job to go through that difficult time, through those troubles that he had. I mean, lost the family, lost all his property, and, and himself being sick, having boils all over him. He, he couldn't sit anywhere except in ashes and stuff like that, you know. Man, that had to be a terrible time. She didn't give up on him, though. Though he slay me, I would trust him. You see, this is sometimes when you go through difficult time and you have troubles in your own life, it might be just that the Lord is trying to point out something to you. There's something that you're holding back from the Lord. You have not given it to the Lord yet. Think about that. The Lord takes bad things and turns them around for the good so that he can continually bless you, minister to you. But you have to be willing to lay down your life for him. He did it for you. And you do that for him. And you love him that much that you want to be the way the Lord wants you to be. Oh, hallelujah. You see, our Lord Jesus is our example, right? He was man. He completely laid down everything about what he was before. He came from a wonderful place to come into the stinking world to help you and me. You know? But you know what happened when he was a man? Take a look at this, uh, the passage here in Hebrews chapter 5, verse 7 through 9. During the days of Jesus' life on earth, he offered up prayers and petitions with fervent cries and tears to the one who could save him from death, and he was heard because of his reverent submission. Son, though he was, he learned, take a hold of that, he learned obedience from what he suffered. He learned obedience from what he suffered. Like I said, he was like you and me, human being. He had to learn obedience through suffering. And that's sometimes we go to difficult times. Whatever it is, don't give up. Don't give up. You know, it's uh, um, one more, a couple more passages, and then we're done. Hebrews chapter 10, <clears throat> verses 36 to 39. You need to pre persevere so that when you have done the will of God, you will receive what he has promised. For in just a little while, he who is coming will come and will not delay. And but my righteous one will live by faith, and I take no pleasure in the one who shrinks back. But we do not belong to those who shrink back and are destroyed, but to those who have faith and are saved. So don't give up. Don't shrink back. Why? Well, in Jeremiah 29, verse 11 through 13, the Lord gives us this kind of encouragement. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. Then you will call on me and come and pray to me, and I will listen to you. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. Hallelujah. That's what the Lord wants us to recognize. You see, there's, uh, God is looking for praises. God is looking for your love. God is looking for your obedience. Like you see, the Lord Jesus himself had to learn obedience through suffering. And sometimes we have to go through that. So don't give up. If you want to become more and more like Jesus, if you want to mature, if you don't want to stay as a child, as a baby, you want to be a man, a woman of the Lord. You want to be what he wants you to be. And you strive after that. You don't give up on it, no matter what comes into your life, because you are Father filtered. 
He knows exactly what's going on, and he will not allow anything come through to you that is harmful to you in a way. You know, it's, it's just that he keeps, an eye, he keeps his eye on you, and he wants you to learn to become more and more like Jesus. So, so let's give God the praises and thankful, and being thankful to him and for everything. Learn to become more like Jesus by laying down your life for him. Amen. Hallelujah, Father. I pray, Lord, that your word, not what I said, but what you spoke through the Spirit to each one of us here. We all have the Holy Spirit in us, and we should listen to what he tells us to do. We must not be afraid. We must not be discouraged, but we must know that you have good plans for each one of us, that you take the bad, even what the enemy uses, and even what some people might use, you take those bad things, turn them around, and make something good out of that. You've proven that by, by your son dying on the cross. It looked bad at that time, but you turned it around and made something good out of that by bringing the salvation to all of us. And we thank you and we praise you and we worship you for all that you have done and all that you will do yet, Lord. You have good plans for each one of us. And we expect good things to happen because you're a good God. No matter what it looks like, you're still in charge. And we must recognize that you want us to become more and more like your son. So I release all that to you and to the people here. I pray that that there be some fruit coming forth for your honor and for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.